So this is my story. I'm a pediatric doctor that got tired of seeing patients in hospital because for majority of them, it was mostly too late and largely preventable. But how could I blame them when we know we've designed a system that doesn't work for most people? Kind of like Alice, trying to fit through that one door to get into Wonderland. And let's not sugarcoat it. Healthcare is broken. And nowhere is this more obvious than in mental health. We all have stories of how ourselves or the people that we care about has been affected by mental health or more tragically, lost to suicide. You see, mental health is common. One in two of you will face it sometime. And of those who first have symptoms to when you finally seek help, the lag time is eight years. And yet only 20% of those who seek help felt that they got the help that they need. So even, though, even during medical school, I was really passionate about tackling inequality in our health outcomes. I think it appealed to that sense of fairness that has guided a lot of the decisions in my life. And when you work in the system, you quickly see the factors that perpetuate these outcomes, such as certain population groups struggling to get early access to care. So even though I wasn't technically trained in mental health, it was really clear to me that if I was to innovate in this space, it would make the biggest impact in people's lives. And that if I wanted to make an impact at scale, technology was the only vehicle to do this. And of course, as a millennial, it boggles my mind that there is so much convenience and control that we have in our lives due to technology. From being able to transfer money from one bank account to another, from being able to hail a ride from point A to B. And it would be as simple as a few taps on your smartphone. But then when you think about how I worked in healthcare and I felt like I was stuck in the 1960s still using faxes and pages, and for those of you who are younger, you probably have to Google that. Um, it didn't make sense. And the patient really has to battle to get access to their own health information and not just to um, think about how and when they're going to get the care that they need. So the common link between all these innovations I've listed is they're considered disruptive. Disruptive innovation is any innovation that creates a new market that eventually disrupts an existing market because of the superior value that it creates. And then that also displaces the established market leading firms and the expected norms of how to do things. But yet, when you read the headlines of these disruptive, um, disruptive innovations, they seem to be filled with destruction. Take, for example, in America in 2012, when Amazon's online sales started to take off, employment numbers in department stores plunged by 250,000 people. And as we get more and more used to lower prices, you're going to expect more of those brick and mortar stores to close down. So is it possible that we can have disruptive innovation in healthcare without destruction? Maybe. In order to understand how to transform a health system, we first must understand what type of system it is. So healthcare is a complex, adaptive system. Other examples of complex system is the Earth's climate, your human brain. And the reason these systems are complex is because any change to the system leads to unintended consequences that are difficult to predict. And in some cases, even produce the opposite of the desired outcome. And all of this is due to the synergistic effects of the multiple autonomous inputs interacting with each other. Big words, I know. But let me give you a real life example. So if a surgeon is incentivized with a pay for performance model, you expect that more surgeries would be performed, which is great. Unless the reason more surgeries were being performed was because shortcuts were being taken, mistakes were being made, and then the patient has to come back to the hospitals to have those short, um, mistakes be rectified. And perversely, the surgeon then gets paid again. So the theory is a, a system is made out of nodes that are autonomous inputs, such as your health provider and your patient. And my hypothesis is that um, if you create superior value in the connections between those nodes, you're going to be able to disrupt without being destructive. So a year ago, I took a break from clinical medicine to co-found a tech startup called Clearhead. Clearhead is an online, one-stop shop platform for mental health and well-being that's provided directly to all New Zealanders for free. And our vision is that we would improve access to care through the use of AI, helping you figure out what your mental health issue is and then find you the help that you need. And we knew then that 
the only way we could improve access enough to meet the sheer demand that's out there is to use artificial intelligence. We need to augment our limited healthcare workforce because they do take time to train and build up. And what about the opportunity of technology to guide you to the help that you need, rather than having to figure out this confusing maze that our health system is? But if you want different outcomes, you need to make sure that the people working in the system are going to do things differently. And the only way you're going to achieve that is if you design with them something that will make their life easier, not harder, to do the right thing. So this is how we stumble into, into the idea of co-design. Co-design simply means that all the key stakeholders are involved in the design and decision-making of the solution that you're trying to build. And this is quite different from the tick box consultation that often occurs in healthcare where someone has a great idea from the top and then they ask for input when it's too late to make any sort of significant changes. But fundamental to this process is the need to make sure it's centered around the user. As they say, nothing about us without us. And so we didn't start off with preformed solutions. We came with interviews to lots of those with lived experience to understand the problems that they face as well as the outcomes that they want to achieve. So we saw them not as hospital bed numbers. We saw them as people who had thoughts on how the system should work for them, not the other way around. And this is important. 97% of our current mental health funding goes to the top 3% of those with the most severe disorders. Imagine if you rocked up to an emergency department with a broken arm, and of the 100 people that came through, 97 of you got turned away. What sort of uproar would that cause? And yet when our current government's goal is to increase access to the next 20%, I would argue that it's still asking the wrong question, and therefore going to lead you to the wrong outcome, which is, which is that majority of the people still don't have access to the care that they need. But if instead you ask the question of, what will it take for 100% of the people who need help to get it? And then you work backwards, you'll realize the solution you have to come up with has to be transformative. It cannot be more of the same. And when you finally get that working prototype done and you test it out in the real world, you have to keep refining it until it works. And so there's absolutely no room for ego because you cannot believe that you get it right the first time. In fact, in the space of a year, my tiny team of six, all of us under the age of 30, had to build completely from scratch seven software platforms just based on all the iterative feedback that we got. And I am really proud to say that none of them worked more than 40 hours a week to achieve this because, you know, we practice what we preach. And when I say to you, co-design, what is it that's the image in your head? Is it an image of an exclusively invited small team? What if I told you our process was one that was ongoing and it's an open invitation that's involved more than 500 people to date all across New Zealand and just clinicians alone, 200 of them. This picture represents one of the many groups that we co-design with, groups that included mental health users, psychiatrists, non-governmental organizations and many more. But if you want to involve people in healthcare, you have to be flexible around the process. Because you know, most of us are bloody overworked. And so a lot of the co-design process for us was sometimes in groups, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, many of video conferences, and you can even tag team into the process. But if you choose to do that, you need to make sure that you have a consistent team that is um, across the whole process, taking the holistic view across the system, and then making sure that all the different stakeholders understand how their design input comes together. So having heard what I've said, you could probably assume that, oh, they just build a digital tool. But actually, we know gold standard for improving someone's mental health is the human-to-human -human connection. But often, there's a lot of barriers that prevent people from reaching that point. And so because of co-design, we clearly understood what the barriers were and how we were going to solve them. So for example, our AI chatbot mimics a doctor's consult. So in your own time, in the privacy of your own home, you work through the mental health issues you have. And then equipped with better information, you are then more likely to go seek help from your doctor, which previously the stigma would have stopped you from doing so. Then of course, there's the social license of using AI. There's so much backlash right now with the big tech companies on how they're exploiting your data without your permission or your consent around 
and then applying all these algorithms that have huge consequences. Clearhead explicitly states that you own your own data. We don't sell it, and we keep it safe and encrypted. And because we do that, we build the trust of our users. And because they co-design with us, they define how they want the AI algorithms to be applied to their data and in order to help them. But of course, beyond trust, um, we have to show that we deliver on the results that we promise. And so this is my favorite user feedback. The chatbot confirmed what I had suspected, but didn't want to face. I'm now seeking therapy for the issues it raised. And it was so gratifying for us to have this feedback come back just a few months after we launched, to know that we're already solving the problem we had set out to solve. Or that we've only been live for six months and spread completely through word of mouth. And we already have users from all across the country and reaching people with the worst mental health outcomes. And I genuinely believe that co-design was the only way we could have achieved this because of the local champions we build. And of course, with anything in medicine, you need to make sure that it's objectively evaluated. So we're currently running a research trial with the University of Otago to have that. So is the moral of the story that all you need is mass participation? Well, no. You must still have experts in the space to be able to lead and facilitate this process. Otherwise, you know, the results you're going to get as well. Shit. Take, for example, the New Zealand flag referendum. <laughs> 10,000 flag designs submitted, 2.2 million votes, and $26 million later. 57% of those who voted chose to retain the existing New Zealand flag. And a part of the critique is that, yes, it is our democratic right, you know, to delve deep within ourselves and figure out what the flag meant to us. But unless you have flag experts or designers to be able to satisfactorily channel the sentiment of the masses, it's no wonder the status quo is more palatable than the alternatives. Who knows, maybe in an alternate universe, we'd all be flying laser kiwi flag with pride. <laughs> um, but my other lesson is that it's not great ideas that we're missing in order to change the world. It's the courage to do so. When I reflect upon the last one year, the amazing grassroots support we had from our users and our clinician, it was so gratifying, right? But then it was frustrating as hell, actually, when I had to deal with the decision makers of our health system, where it felt like it was talking to a brick wall, um, that I was constantly banging my head against a brick wall. Because in general, they were really risk adverse and just wanted to fund more of the same, because it was familiar. So my call to action to you is this, exercise your democratic right. Vote into power those who are willing to take calculated risk to support innovation, which will then equip us to better deal with the challenges of our time. We need to live in a society where we allow for experimentations and not penalize people through the media or through the short-termism of how we vote. I really love that in 2015, Finland introduced into their prime minister's office a department that ran social experiments, like the universal basic income. These carefully designed society-wide policy trials allows Finland to understand how they could run their society better. And it also gives permission to those Finnish civil servants to test ideas without being afraid um, of the repercussions. I wonder what our world would look like if all our governments had experimental departments in order to deal with the challenges we face. Maybe then, Alice didn't have to shrink herself to fit into that one door and that we would have innovative technologies in our health system to enable the Alice's of the world to come through the door they want to. And my final word is this. Mental illness is a normal part of our society. And the least we can do is to afford those who are seeking help dignity when doing so. Thank you. <laughs>